First, I want to return the thanks to uh, Miguel for being the man of the first hours, for having the idea of organizing this workshop. So Andrea quickly joined. And then we could also ensue Stephen Branton. And uh, Alessandro gave us really this big forum. Without him, we would not have this, the, the, the largest audience of the uh, von Kármán Institute lecture series. Am I right? Yes? And I'm very happy to see so many people here uh, interested in making the long way and interested in our field. And uh, today I will give a um, course uh, about analysis, modeling and control of the cylinder wake. And I must warn you, it will be a bit of a tour de force. So I will quickly move through a number of methods. And I don't, don't expect to understand all the details but um, I would like to communicate why we are doing um, certain things and what is possible. So I would not, uh, you can, con and today I will talk a bit about a Swiss army knife of machine learning methods applied to a innocent looking uh, benchmark um, configuration. And I would not stand here if I would not be assisted by many smart students and colleagues and the ones who have con contributed to the uh, uh, lecture series here are, for instance, uh, Guy Corneo Makeda, Amnang uh, 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 um, Deng, and uh, uh, Daniel Fernet uh, contrib has contributed with a package for reduced uh, um, order mod modeling. I will also present some results of um, Arthur Elot. And of course, uh, we all work together with a couple of senior colleagues, Stephen Branton, Marek Mozinski, uh, Navid Nayeri, Richard Zeman, Francois Lusserang, and, and Luc Pasteur. And first, I would like to know you a bit better. Um, so the language is mathematics and English, clear. Uh, who of you is a bachelor student? Wow. One, two. Uh, uh, who is a master student? Two, three. So it looks like, like, like three and maybe a, a couple of timid ones. Who is a PhD student? Okay, the majority, this is what I've guessed. Postdocs. And I see a couple of old people here. So who is professor and uh, from, from, from industry? Good. Okay, so. We have a pretty, pretty broad spectrum of um, people here. Now, who is in fluid mechanics, engineering? The majority, as expected. Uh, um, physics? A couple. Computer sciences? Good. So, <laughs> so maybe you, you can teach us something. And um, so what, what I will assume, I will assume that the Navier-Stokes equations are known, that the ordinary differential equations are known, PDEs and so on. Linear algebra up to eigenproblems, elementary probabilities uh, um, theory. So not that much. It would be good if you have some background in nonlinear dynamics, but this is not required. And uh, briefly, a few words uh, about me. So I started to study physics when most of you were not born. And uh, then I had a couple of postdocs here, years in uh, Göttingen, and we have already, with, with Dr. Rutten, we have a couple of people from, from um, um, Göttingen here um, um, right now. Then I was two years at the United Technologies Research Stand Center, and this uh, made a former physicist, a real engineer. It was a very formative uh, period of my um, um, time. And then in uh, TU Berlin, I became the first time food professor. And then I switched to the CNRS. So CNRS is something like the Max Planck uh, analog in, uh, in France as a research director at two different institutes. I had a couple of affiliations. I named uh, um, two. And since uh, um, um, last month, I'm professor at the Harvard Institute of Technology. So we have written a couple of books. So the first book was Reduced Order Modeling uh, for Flow Control. And the next book was uh, Flow Control Without Reduced Order Models. So to, 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 to balance the, the story a bit. And um, first, I will talk a bit about the um, cylinder wake, the phenomenology. Then I will give you some 
brief introduction to uh, what I consider as uh, machine learning. And uh, then I will apply the tools to the periodic wake. This will be very easy, PUD, Gayoking. The transient wake will be very difficult, surprisingly difficult. And then I will talk about wake control uh, uh, using human learning, model-based, and wake control using machine learning. So machine learning and control. And after the third um, section, I will make a short break. And you can ask a couple of questions if I don't forget. <laughs> Maybe Miguel, you have to remind me. And so first we go to the cylinder wake. So this is uh, the wake behind a, um, a mountain. You see a beautiful cloud visualization. Very surprising to see a wake, uh, such a wake uh, um, behind uh, uh, a very three-dimensional bottle. But, uh, um, but, but uh, in meteorology, this can be easily explained. I will not pause to do so. This is an oil visualization. Uh, of vortex setting. So you, here you see a harvested uh, um, tanker losing its oil. So you can use a vortex um, street to, to um, 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 track it. In uh, uh, um, the next slides, you don't see vortex shedding, but you see it should not be ignored. This is the unlucky Tacoma Bridge. So Tacoma committed suicide six months after the bridge collapsed. He became so fam famous with this bridge that he could not get an another job. And of course, uh, harvested tankers and uh, collapsing bridges and cloud visualization are not particularly reliable or environmental friendly and so on. So for our investigations, we need something much more simple to study vortex shedding and we take the cylinder wake. So the cylinder wake is pretty well um, understood. Um, it's based on the Reynolds number. So when the Reynolds number is uh, smaller than four, you have a single separation point. If it becomes larger, then you have a steady vortex uh, bubble. The vortex bubble increases. At some point, you have a, uh, a supercritical Hopf bifurcation. Oscillation starts. So this is the 2D vortex. Then you see 2D vortex shedding. And at a Reynolds number around 180, you have three-dimensional structure superimposing by the vortex setting. But what is kind of surprising is the, the instability at the low Reynolds number essentially coins the coherent structures at uh, very high Reynolds numbers. And maybe uh, Xavier will explain some of this more. <laughs> and of course, there's not only the cylinder wake. The cylinder wake is one of five classical types of flows. Uh, here you see a jet, a grid turbulence, again a wake, mixing layer, and a turbulent uh, um, and boundary layer. And the cylinder wake is the most simple one. So if a method does not work for the cylinder wake, you can forget it for all the other flows. And of course, there are many more flows of engineering importance, which are much more complex, and which we can be typically considered as composed of shear layers, wakes, and, and, and these uh, um, prototypic flows. So here you see some energy system and some thing for the um, production. But we will stay pretty much with a cylinder wake and we have one example of a car. So now we go to uh, uh, machine learning. And so you are here because machine learning is a very hot topic. And, and try, I try to boil it down a bit. I would say machine learning is essentially uh, um, about um, um, solving the regression problems. That means you have a function from A to B, and now there are two possibilities. Number one, you have lots of data, pairs of A, B, and you try to fit a function. And uh, number two, you want to optimize a function, um, um, like, like a, a controller or something like that. In this case, you would need to test uh, um, um, the performance of the function somewhere. And um, so the f first kind of problems is essentially function fitting. There's something which is very easy, namely the interpolation. If you know the B values at these A values and you want to estimate uh, the B values somewhere in between, simply do linear interpolation, very simple. The method really does not matter. Now the next thing is more difficult, extrapolation. You have your database here, but you want to extrapolate the response a bit further away. And now you have several choices. For instance, you can say, I have a constant function, then you end up here. You can say, I have a linear function, then I end up here. You can say, I have a quadratic function, then you end up here. So extrapolation cannot be solved in machine learning. This is, this is a very difficult uh, um, problem. And 
Uh, and when we are solving more the variational problems, if you have to identify a complete function, in this case we can do some what is called exploitation. So exploitation essentially means we can do some gradient uh, um, method. So we, so we use the neighborhood of uh, um, um, our functions or our parameters. And in some cases, we uh, may not be confident that we are sliding down the right minimum. In this case, we need to do some exploration. Now, uh, uh, machine learning and AI is typically considered as uh, sy sy synonymous, uh, similar. Actually, it, it, it is. So all of machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence has a couple of elements like natural language recognition or expert system, which are typically considered AI-specific and not part of the uh, uh, machine learning part. And of, co of course, a couple of very hot topics in machine learning are deep neural networks and um, reinforcement learning. So one was uh, motivated reinforcement learning was motivated by AlphaGo victory 2017, and neural networks are the, are the, are the core behind uh, language uh, um, recognition. And now we go to fluid mechanics, and I would say a lot of our fluid mechanics uh, problems are regression problems. Um, so let's look. We want to find a closure relationship, so a function from the flow or the gradient of the flow to the Smagorensky viscosity or some effective viscosity. This is one mapping. Another mapping, so, so this is uh, 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 what? Is it, is it a variational problem or a curve fitting model? Well, typically it's a variational model because you don't have the direct connection. Next thing is you want to predict. You know the current state, you want to know the future state. So essentially this is solving uh, um, ordinary differential equations or PDEs. You may want to do state estimation. So you measure certain hot wire signals and you want to estimate the whole flow field. And you have some data with the corresponding um, pairs. So this is data fitting. Or you want to determine a controller. So you measure something and you want to re react on what you are measuring in order to optimize some cost function. For instance, reduce some drag or increase some lift or something uh, um, like that. So this is a variational problem. Because if you, if you know your response uh, to, to one sensor signal, you do not have a complete controller. You cannot determine the cost. There's no notion of a local error. And you, maybe you want to do some parametrics. So from Stefan Goertz, we will hear about uh, 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 um, ha having, having an airplane, several Reynolds numbers, several Mach numbers, several angles um, of attack, and so on. And from a couple of simulations, uh, we want to uh, interpolate and perhaps extrapolate the performance at, 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 at some other parameters. And there's something which is uh, um, um, enabling a lot of these tasks, for instance, thank you, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, state estimation. You want to boil down your high dimensional data and you want, want to boil it down to something low dimensional. And so in machine learning, this is called an autoencoder. Essentially, you map the original velocity field to something low dimensional and then you, match, uh, uh, you map the, the lo low dimensional uh, vector back to the original um, data. So essentially you construct the identity, but you go through um, a small um, uh, um, 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 throttle. So essentially autoencoder is, is, is this. So PUD would be an autoencoder. Low dimensional representations are autoencoders. And there's one part which you learn in machine learning, a meter, how to avoid overfitting. So how to do the... Uh, um, you, um, use validation data and training data uh, um, wisely. So this gives you an idea about what machine learning is and how it could be used in, in fluid mechanics. We go now to the periodic cylinder wake and we start a bit more first principle wake uh, um, based. So now we want to have something like a low dimensional representation of the cylinder wake. We could take, for instance, uh, um, the steady solution here and some stability modes um, here, and then we have time-dependent coefficients. In this case, this marks the fluctuation, and this is kind of the basis. So in this case, we live on something like an n-dimensional space. And what is um, interesting, the Gaiokin approximation here fulfills the boundary, most boundary conditions. If you have, for instance, a uniform oncoming flow, it's captured by that one. Then this uh, uh, um, flow will solve, these modes will solve homogenized equations. So for arbitrary coefficients here, you always satisfy the boundary condition for the um, original um, flow. So we would like to have such an expansion representing the flow being as compact as possible. And of course, this is, it's, it's most easy 
uh, to come at the solution if you know the solution. And now we are assuming we have already a couple of data points. So this could be um, um, velocity fields here. And the idea of the PUD is to tune these modes to minimize the residual or to best resolve um, um, the largest um, um, fluctuation. So the first mode uh, um, is, the, is in the direction where you have the largest variance in your data. The second mode is in the direction where you have the second largest, largest variance and so on. So this is a qualitative idea of the PUD and you will learn more in, uh, um, to, to, today. Now, for the cylinder wake, uh, um, it's, it's rather easy. So the, uh, you, now you get the, the mean flow here. These are the first mode, essentially the first harmonics uh, uh, with some, something like uh, a minus cosine and, and, and a sine. So they resolve around 95% of the fluctuation energy. Second harmonics, uh, they resolve another 4.9% of the fluctuation energy. Third harmonics, Force harmonics. So essentially, the PUD mode does you a favor and does something like a Fourier analysis. Um, so this is observed for a couple of flows, but there's no mathematical theory that this, this should always be the case, and there are also counter examples. Now, the next question is uh, when we know this um, expansion, can we build a dynamical system? And now, let's forget a bit uh, um, that we have data. Let's see if we can derive something interesting from the Navier-Stokes equation. So here, uh, we, we, we start uh, uh, with a... I think the battery is off. <laughs> you, 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 want, you want us already. <laughs> Okay. Does reach? So how many of those do you have? Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> for a few hours. Okay. <laughs> good, good, good. So uh, what is easy to see is when you have the, uh, you look at the Navier-Stokes equation that there should be one term which corresponds to the time derivative. For something like a linear um, viscous term, you should also have something like a linear Gajorkian term. For a quadratic term, you should also get something like a quadratic term. It's a bit difficult to see why you should get for a pressure term another quadratic term, but you can see it from the uh, pressure Poisson equation. Now, how do we arrive at these things? Well, first we need something like an inner product. So the inner product is uh, I'm, I'm defined here. You integrate over the volume. Uh, um, the velocity fields with an Euclidean inner product. product. Uh, the PUD has orthogonal uh, uh, modes. So this simpl simplifies um, um, some terms. And now we make a Gajokin projection for the, for the um, first term. So we multiply this with a mode and integrate this over the domain. So this is the first term. Now we put in the, the expansion. Uh, um, A0 um, um, equals um, um, unity, so that we have this um, a, um, expansion. So this can be, uh, um, can, can be cancelled, uh, and then we can uh, pull some uh, uh, the, the coefficients um, um, out and take the derivatives and so on. At the end, we have this term. And with the same method, we can also derive all the other terms. So this is the Gajokin method in a nutshell. And probably you ask yourself now, does it work? Yes, it works beautifully. Uh, uh, so the d data here corresponds to the simulation. So this is A1, A2, so the most dominant modes. And the uh, um, um, circle corresponds to the uh, um, Gajorkin model. Beautiful agreement, and, and we should be happy. But you, you, you change a bit the um, viscosity, and uh, you change the viscosity, the Reynolds number from 100 to 80, and you get to the fixed point. You change the viscosity from, from 100 to 120, and it explodes. You look at the transient, and the transient are uh, 20 times longer than the real uh, transient. You look at this point here, and it's, it's a mean flow, not the steady solution. So uh, we are a bit in trouble. Uh, so we have a beautiful model, but it has a very uh, uh, um, narrow range of validity. And now we go to a more complex problem, the transient wake. So we look uh, uh, now at one quantity of the cylinder wake. Let's take the lift. And we start close to the steady solution uh, where we see some um, um, stability modes um, originating. So initially, the lift is, is steady. And, and at some point, it starts to oscillate. 
and then we go to the limit cycle. So we see the typical uh, ingredients of a self-amplified amplitude limited um, oscillator. And when you also take the derivative of the um, um, lift coefficient, then, oh, I wanted to uh, uh, um, um, let you ask some questions after the search. <laughs> so do you have questions so far? Is this good or bad? <laughs> Does it mean everything is clear? Oh. Now, the interesting stuff comes now, transient wake. So, so we look at the, uh, some sensor signal, for instance, we look at the lift coefficient. Uh, if we take the derivative of the lift coefficient, then we get a clear imprint of something like a Landau oscillator. And looks very easy, but there's, a, there's some, some trouble. And the trouble is if you look at the modes, uh, initially, we have something like stability modes. So this one here corresponds to this mode. Here we have the stability mode. So, so there's already a significant change from the patterns as you go from here to here. And when you are on the limit cycle, uh, the fluctuation level goes further upstream. So somehow we see already it, 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 it should not be possible to put it in, in, a, in a simple uh, um, Gaiokin um, framework. So what we really have is uh, uh, a situation which is uh, depicted uh, um, here. We start at the steady solution. So this is a steady solution. Then we move outwards on a plane. So this is the real part and the imaginary part uh, of the most amplified uh, mode, the only most amplified mode. If you would stay on this plane, this would go forever. So linear stability analysis cannot uh, uh, um, explain the amplitude saturation. So, so what, what happens? Well, we have a nonlinearity. More precisely, we have a Reynolds stress. And the Reynolds stress changes uh, um, the base flow. So as the fluctuation uh, moves more and more up, the, the uh, mean flow becomes shorter and shorter. So it's adding, this bubble is adding away by the Reynolds stress. And this change of the bubble from the steady solution to the mean flow is communicated uh, uh, by essentially something like the difference mode, which we call the shift mode. So essentially it points from the steady solution to this mode, and essentially it's a reverse flow. So if you have a reverse flow here, sorry, then it's, it's a forward flow. Reverse flow here, you add a forward flow and then you can reduce this bubble. So there's a linear relationship between this amplitude and the and, uh, uh, bubble length. And, um, so you, you, so you start here, then the base flow changes. At some point, you end up on a limit cycle. The limit cycle uh, has, has a different uh, base flow, and, and the PUD mode now characterizes the first um, harmonics. Now, if you build the Gaiokin model, and the Gaiokin model only contains this data, we, we only spend this plane, and essentially this plane is neutrally stable. So we cannot capture the, the, the amplitude growth or the decay at minimum, uh, not uh, um, realistically. And in a second, I will show you how we can derive the equation for the uh, um, amplitude motion, more precisely the Reynolds equation. So I will return to this uh, um, um, slide uh, um, shortly. So what are the most relevant uh, uh, modes? The most relevant modes are related to the first harmonics. We can take, for instance, the first two uh, PUD modes. And there is a base flow change. So this is something like the shift mode. Now we have three modes. And uh, the um, and basic mode is a steady solution. If now the expansion has um, um, three modes, as shown here, and uh, the dynamical system after the Gaiokin projection should look something like that. So it has a linear term, it has a quadratic term. It cannot have a constant term because if you put in the steady solution in the Navier-Stokes equation, then you have A equals zero. So A equals zero must be a fixed point of this dynamical system. And now if you assume that uh, the uh, mode number one and two are, osc uh, are the oscillatory, that means A1 and A2 are something like a sine and cosine, and uh, the, the third mode um, is slowly varying. So this corresponds well to what we find uh, in the um, um, simulation. In this case, you would be inclined to make polar coordinates. Uh, um, so there's an amplitude and a phase. And if you expand the amplitude with this Gaiokin expansion and the phase with this Gaiokin expansion and, and, and also the shift mode um, amplitude, then you get these terms plus higher harmonics. 
So for a uniform um, rotation, the higher harmonics would vanish, and essentially uh, uh, and this must be somehow the dynamics uh, um, of the um, 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 flow. So this is one of m several ways of, of, of de deriving uh, um, um, these equations. Now we have again the Gajokin system, this uh, uh, um, Gajokin system uh, with, with a higher harmonics. Now we observe that the growth rate uh, um, is much slower than the damping rate of the third mode. So where, wherever we start, we quickly move uh, um, um, to this mean field paraboloid. We can neglect this uh, um, um, derivative. That means A3 is slaved to the um, square of the fluctuation level. And, and we move on something like this uh, um, um, paraboloid. Now, if we insert essentially this paraboloid back into the original equation, and this one becomes the Landau equation. So uh, we have uh, um, a linear growth rate and a cubic damping. So w when I looked in Landau Lipschitz uh, um, in my, my student time, I was very surprised that the quadratic nonlinearity can give, give rise to cubic damping, but you can only get higher order damping at the moment you have a manifold. So essentially, if something like R squared, a second order term is linked to a first order, uh, order, order term. And so here you see the cubic damping, and you also see that the uh, um, um, frequency changes. Typically, the higher the amplitude, uh, the smaller, uh, um, also the higher the, 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 the frequency. So this is how we now arrive at these equations. And back uh, um, to this equation, this is essentially our state space picture, uh, which we uh, should have uh, in mind. Now, there is a, probably for many people, uh, it, it, it looks like a lot of things have been hand-cooked with a lot of physical uh, um, insights and, uh, and assumption and so on. And the question is, can you somehow distill the paraboloid more automatically, out in an automated uh, uh, way? And the answer is yes. And uh, um, the key idea is called locally uh, linear embedding. So who of you has heard about it? Okay, Laurent, <laughs> Guy, <laughs> Scott, <laughs> the, the, the senior people. Uh, so the basic idea of a locally linear embedding is that uh, there are a lot of, uh, the, the, all the data may live on a low-dimensional manifold, and if it lives on a low-dimensional manifold, uh, you can see it here, you would like to have a mapping from uh, some, some um, something of the dimension of the manifold to the original data set. So here we have an S-shaped uh, um, 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 or original data. We generate some um, um, data points here. So they are a bit uh, um, 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 noisy to, to, to essentially test the robustness of the method. And now there's a method which creates a mapping from some feature coordinates to the original shape. So here, what did we gain? Uh, uh, here we go from two dimension to three dimension. We did not gain not much, but we can do the same also, of course, from two to four, from two to uh, infinity. And um, if it, I will not, I will explain the algorithm uh, um, um, later when I talk about reduced order modeling. So this is an appetizer. We apply it now to the cylinder wake, and for the setting, we take some. Here you see the fluctuation energy over the time steady solution, average flow. I'm talking about uh, um, results of um, Arthur um, um, Ehlert. So we take essentially uh, the data from the beginning of the oscillation uh, um, to, the, to, the, to the limit cycle. Uh, um, so close to 1%, this is, uh, um, I think, 50%, this is 100% of the fluctuation level. And we take something like 16 transients, 1,000 snapshots each. So we have a lot of transients at this moment. And when we do this locally linear embedding, we get uh, something uh, uh, very interesting. Essentially, we get these uh, coordinates. This is, let's say, gamma 1, gamma 2. This point here corresponds to the steady solution. These points here uh, correspond to periodic uh, um, and vortex shedding. Uh, as a point in the neighborhood of the steady solution, if I pick this point and look which velocity field 
this corresponds to. Here I see the stability modes, here I see the intermediate modes, and, and here uh, I see uh, I'm the, I'm the limit cycle. So that means in an automated way, I can distill a two-dimensional manifold of the original data, and the error is something like 1%, which is probably the numerical uh, um, error. So all the data lives on a two-dimensional manifold, as uh, we uh, could have expected. Now the question is, we know we will learn uh, PUD expansion, DMD expansion, and so on. What do they um, 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 give? We take the transient uh, data. So this is the first PUD mode, second PUD mode, water shedding, nice. This is the shift mode, essentially the base flow variation. Now we see a mixed mode. Then we see something like which corresponds a bit like uh, to, to the second harmonics. Then we see a mixed mode, and then we see some other mixed modes. So the PUD modes are... Uh, are not frequency pure, and they don't have to be frequency um, pure. If you look at the um, amplitudes, they are the first three behave like in our um, essentially uh, um, mean field uh, uh, model, uh, our least order Gaiokin model. Then we have some intermediate mode, so it looks a bit uh, um, um, ugly, not very good. Now you can say, why did you take PUD? And you know, for the I'm talking now for the experts, and why didn't you talk about uh, um, um, DMD. Well, we did uh, um, DMD. So these are the most pronounced uh, DMD mode. The first one, the second one, the third one, essentially these have slightly different um, frequency than the other one. So we take the uh, DMD mode uh, which uh, contribute uh, um, largest uh, um, um, to, the, to, to the expansion. So essentially everything looks pure here, so it looks much nicer. Now there's of course a little but. When you do DMD, uh, you have a linear framework. Essentially, your expansion um, of the first mode will look something like that. You always have then you have oscillations which are either increasing or decaying. That means if you would now extrapolate things right on the limit cycle, of course you will you will see you will, you you will get uh, wrong results. If you go left from the from your data region you will also get uh, a wrong results. So the DMD can be very good if you are in the linear regime. It can be very good when you are on a tractor, but they're not particularly well suited on the, um, uh, in, 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 the, in the transient regime. And then we have made a switcher between both, which we have called recursive DMD. I will talk about it later. Uh, what we essentially do, we uh, um, um, require monochromaticity of the modes, but we found a trick to make those modes um, orthogonal, and, and then we essentially get near uh, uh, the similar resolution like uh, um, PUD, and, and, uh, 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 but, but we have um, a, a, a pure frequency uh, um, um, behavior. So these are the corresponding amplitudes. The first three look as we expected, then there exist some intermediate modes, and the other modes essentially contribute to, to a shape deformation uh, and, and to higher um, harmonics. If you look now at the residual, so here you see uh, the, the fluctuation residual. Uh, one means 100%, um, so you don't resolve anything of the fluctuation, and, and you go down two decades, if you look at uh, um, um, PUD, of course, it becomes increasingly better, but for a 1% energy error, you need 50 PUD modes. So you have to let this sink. You have a two-dimensional manifold, and you need 50 PUD mode for a 1% energy error, and a 1% energy error is a 10% amplitude error. So PUD is something very nice, but may not always be the best thing to do. So this is essentially... Uh, uh, um, uh, a credo that manifold models, you should consider uh, a manifold models. With, with a recursive DMD, we sacrifice a bit accuracy, we are not much worse, and we get a bit purer uh, modes. In terms of the uh, resolution residual, DMD modes are, are, are not very good, as expected. Questions so far? Uh, it's a good point. So uh, the question is, what, what, do you, what do you lose when you do LLE? 
and, and essentially you lose nothing. If you are on the limit cycle, you can m multiply the limit cycle with cosine phi, and then you have something, one POD mode, with sine phi, and then you have the other POD mode. You can multiply it with cosine two phi, and, and you get the second harmonic, sine two phi, and so on. So essentially you get all the, the, all the POD modes, and if you, uh, by the same argument, you can also get all the DMD mode, because essentially the DMD mode and the POD mode are both Fourier mode for the, for the limit cycle. And so uh, you, you c I would say the um, locally linear embedding is a generalization of, of, of it. Now, at some point, you may say I'm cheating a bit because uh, uh, um, we live on a two-dimensional manifold, but how is a two-dimensional manifold characterized? Well, we have 16 transients and 1,000 snapshots each, so we have something like, like uh, 16,000 snapshots which characterize this manifold. So uh, that means the data load on, on the reconstruction of the flow is, is, is very high, uh, uh, but still, the dynamics is two-dimensional, and uh, um, there's a big difference between two dimension and, and 50 dimension. In two dimension, you can build a dynamical model, you can make an estimator, you can do a control, uh, you can do everything. If you have 50 modes, essentially you just have a noise generation. With 50 modes, uh, it's next to impossible to calibrate it and get a good prediction, uh, uh, um, do the control design with a good dynamic estimator in it and so on. So sometimes these manifold models can be um, a real enabler. Any other question? Yes. Yeah, I can ask a question about when you did the projection of the Navier scope from the mode. Uh, what did you do with the pressure term? Very good. Did you ignore it, or you have separate modes for the pressure field? I'm just wondering how that works. Um, so in this case, uh, um, I've ignored it when I, when I had a large domain. So when I have something like 15 diameters and the pressure term is rather small, but the pressure term becomes very relevant if you have a short domain. If you have something like six or seven diameters, then you have to include the pressure term because the pressure term is an, either an energy uh, source or an, an, an energy sink. And now that question is, how do you incorporate the pressure term? Now there are many, many possibilities. And you have alluded to one, namely you do the PUD of the pressure field and you put the pressure field in, the, in, in this Navier-Stokes equations and you have one system of, of equations uh, for the, for the uh, um, POD mode amplitudes for the velocity field and, and you solve the other co coefficients with the pressure Poisson equation. This is one possibility. Another possibility, actually you can derive, you can, you, you can de uh, um, um, derive an accurate pressure term representation uh, uh, for the um, POD modes. So this is what we did 2005 and one JFM. This is another possibility. So if you ask Angelo Yolo, so Angelo Yolo essentially calibrated an extra term in order to account for the uh, modeled pressure model. It turns out that in many cases, uh, the additional terms which you have to, to, to add uh, because of the pressure are just uh, linear. I can tell you a couple more approaches, but I think uh, <laughs> this is no, no very interesting for you, but not for the big audience. So, last question. Good. Then we go to the next thing, a control. So, when when when, when you do analysis, so analysis is uh, always very e easy because when 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 you get dead data, you can always make a plot y over x, and the data cannot complain anymore. Uh, if you do dynamical modeling, dynamical modeling is a bit more difficult because in the dynamical model you want to predict the future and maybe you do not know the future. So uh, you, you, you have an element of cross-validation. Now, at the moment uh, uh, you do uh, um, um, control, you have a much worse situation. So essentially, you want to predict the future, but not only the future, the, the unforced future, but the future for many different actuations. And this is a very hard uh, business. And in most of the cases, uh, uh, you will not have enough data for, for um, this um, um, uh, type of uh, um, control. So first, I will show you a case, the cylinder wake, of course, where we have this uh, um, data. And the task is as following. So, so we cannot build the controller based on the Navier-Stokes equation, because if anything is larger than 10 dimensional, then the control methods typically blow up or become very difficult. So we would like to have a low dimensional model um, of our original plant. So here you see the plant, B is our actuation signal, 
And S is our sensor signal, so it's sensor-based uh, feedback control. Uh, we don't want to do it with the original plant, with the Navier-Stokes equation or the experiment. We want to derive a model before. And once we have the model, determining a controller is easy. And then we copy this controller from our model uh, uh, in, in our original plant. Uh, and the, the goal is always to optimize some performance, J. So essentially the model also must give the performance, let's say drag, lift, whatever, which we eventually measure. So now the task is build a model. Uh, which contains the state and the actuation commands. You need some measurements equations. And from this, derive a controller which only rates on what you know, namely your sensor signals. I will talk about the right-hand side uh, um, um, later. So the right-hand side is kind of a shortcut, which is uh, emulated in natural uh, um, fluid mechanics. So here we go uh, uh, um, again, back to the cylinder wake. Um, we have discussed uh, this, and typical control problem is stabilize, so essentially reverse the Hopf bifurcation. Now we are at Reynolds number 100, the critical Reynolds number is something like 42, way above, lots of fluctuation. We want to go back to zero, and we assume now something a bit academic. Uh, um, we assume that we have something like a volume force here, so the volume force